welcome to Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and I really dig your platform shoes. Today, we're going to talk about the future. I want you to picture the Matrix. We're all living in a computer simulation with Keanu Reeves, lots of trench coats, computers, you know the score. Now, picture office space. The delightful 90s era Mike Judge film. Got it? All right, now combine the two, and you've got something approaching the world Robin Hansen predicts in his book, The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life When Robots Rule the Earth. While that book, which we will discuss with the author in a, mem- a moment, is set in the future, it touches on a lot of issues that are affecting us now or will quite soon. For example, you guys worried about automation? I am. Not at the moment. Right now, it's pretty hard to replace me with a robot. Engineers haven't quite cracked the code on how to get robots to write jokes and funny advertisements. But let's say 10, 15 years from now, Ray Kurzweil finally figures out how to download a brain onto a computer. And that downloaded brain can work as an employee of a company living inside of its computer system. Hence, the matrix meets office space. How might that change the economy? Presumably, every major company would want their very own Steve Jobs or equivalent in the mainframe. Maybe even 10 or 20 Steve Jobs. Although based on my understanding of Steve Jobs, they'd probably kill each other. But that's fine, because you could replicate a personality on a computer so you could find six or seven most type A personalities at your company and then just keep duplicating them over and over again until it's you, an electronic Steve Jobs, and an army of workaholics. It also means that Norm MacDonald could download his brain onto a computer, then hire out those copies of himself to companies so that each one of them has their very own Norm MacDonald on staff cracking jokes and making comedy. I can't compete with that. The Age of M by Robin Hanson makes some very bold claims about what work will look like in the future. It's part policy white paper, part the matrix, and we will dive in momentarily. But first, since Norm MacDonald hasn't hoard his brain out electronically yet, I can still be of use writing ad copy around here. So here goes. Something's Off with Andrew Heaton is brought to you by Formal Plumbers. When you want your toilet unclogged by someone who dresses like a lounge singer, Formal Plumbers has you covered. You're the captain of the Titanic, the largest and most luxurious cruise liner in history. It's so impressive that newspapers call it the ship even God can't sink. And he can't. Before its maiden voyage, you invited Charles Darwin aboard to cast atheist spells on the Titanic to protect it from Jehovah. It has smoking parlors, game rooms, a kitchen fit for a king, sun decks, a parking garage for debutantes to have sex with con artists in, and the finest, most luxurious toilets in the history of mankind. But there's one thing you didn't count on, and that's icebergs. Usually, icebergs are frightened by human activity. They don't like the sound or smell of ships. But while you were asleep, the ship's assistant captain accidentally ran the Titanic between an iceberg and her cub. Protective and alarmed, she attacked. And now there's a gaping hole in the side of your ship. And not even Darwin's atheist magic can keep her from slipping into the briny deep. As hundreds of people scream and clamor towards the lifeboats, you consider putting on women's clothing and escaping. But you decide against it. You hate cross-dressing. No, better to go down with the ship. But before you do, you got to use the bathroom. When you walk into the bridge's restroom facilities, you see something amazing. Three formal plumbers who know they are going to sink with a ship are nonetheless plunging toilets so that the other doomed passengers can have bowel movements in peace before they die. As the cold waters of the Atlantic slide up around your ankles, one of the formal plumbers turns to another and says, Gentlemen, it's been an honor unclogging with you. Well done, formal plumbers. Well done. Formal apparel isn't just stylish. It's emblematic of the honor and work ethic every formal plumber brings to dislodging dislodging hardened fecal matter from your toilet or dislodging sand and gunk from your sink. Every formal plumber meets with a personal stylist before receiving his company plunger to ensure that he's the best dressed technician there is 
when he's at your house, going to town on an occluded bathtub with a red suction cup on a stick. Formal Plumbers, fix your crapper with a guy in a tux. My guest today is Robin Hanson. He is the author of The Age of M and an economist and a, a number of other uh, awards and intellectual pedigrees that are on top of him. But we're predominantly concerned with the book today. Uh, Dr. Hanson, thank you for coming on. It's great to be here. Wonderful. So uh, you have a, a, almost like a science fiction novel manual in your book. It, it is, it's nonfiction. Indeed. But it's so specific. Yeah, it's got way too much detail. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's really, I enjoyed it because I, I've written some science fiction myself, and like by by chapter two, I was like, I can totally rip this guy off. I'm going to take his book and put a plot of it. <laughs> I and wish make you a bunch would. I wish you would, really. What? Actually, have you, have you read? I like to, huh? Go ahead. I like to say it's like science fiction, except there's no plot and there's no characters, and it all makes sense. It's uh, that last part that was the selling point for me. I've been reading uh, science fiction all my life, uh -huh. but it, the more I've learned, the more frustrated I get that when you think about it, it just doesn't make sense. Have you have you read Permutation City? Because it actually has a lot of parallels course, with yeah, your book. Absolutely. You you have? Uh huh. But there's 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 yes, but there's very little in that book analyzing the sort of social structure and social dynamics that I have in my book. So right. that just introduced the idea of M's. But I didn't really think through what their world would be like. Right. So, uh, okay. So tell me, tell me what M's are, and tell me what the world will look like once such a thing exists. So an M is a different way of producing artificial intelligence. You've probably heard lots of stuff in the news about deep learning, et cetera. This is a whole different approach. Instead of trying to write software or use statistics to make it, you just take the software that's in a human brain right now and you copy it. And you put that in a computer. That's the key idea. Mm -hmm. You make a model in a computer that runs just like a particular human's brain. And once it's out of that person's brain, it can be copied. It can be sped up or slowed down. It can be immortal. And that's an emulation. Okay. So that's an emulation or what you call an M. And uh, it's, so, so the, the, the technological breakthrough necessary for such a thing to exist would basically be the ability to upload a human brain into a computer and then have have that function as a brain, not just the, the memories, but actually have someone exist right. within a virtual space or a digital space. And then and we're not close yet. It might be a century, but still, it's going to be a long time to produce AI really through any other means true. So I still think there's a decent chance that this is the first kind of c computer that's as smart as a person. It, we, it could be. I mean, I, I don't know where we are in terms of my machine interface technology, but there's been some really interesting stuff on the horizon. Uh, I worked for the House of Representatives briefly a few years ago, and even then, um, there was a exhibit that I went and saw um, that was put on, I think, by the Defense Department, maybe the Pentagon. Um, but it had a you could put on a headset and you could you could using beta waves from your brain without touching anything, you could move a ball across the screen, which at the time I thought was just uh, uncannily uh, eerie um, that I could I could move something using brain waves, and I think that's probably advanced. And I that would have been like eight years ago, so I assume it's better. I've also heard right. that there are there we'll be are getting uh, better. But that doesn't compete with M's. By the time when M's are feasible, it'll just beat that completely. So that that won't be at all really competitive. Right. Once you have an M. So so yeah, with with M's, we've we've we're we're, we're uh, for the conversation moving forward. We're assuming that this technology will exist or can exist, and at that point, we're going to have people that are uploaded into some sort of digital space. So at that point, right. I, think, uh, I I assume I think, that I am probably not going to be the first person people want to upload into their computer. Uh, because I don't know that I would be the best employee to replicate thirty or forty times. What what would what would the selection be like for for people? Is this do do we all pay money and get uploaded into the mainframe, or is this like IBM well, just picks well, the, the workaholics? Well, yeah. So so first of all, the key assumption is that it's cheap enough. So when this technology exists, but it costs a billion dollars each, then it doesn't make much of a difference. Mm -hmm. The key point is when it's cheaper to make one of these kind of workers than to hire an ordinary human worker, then everything changes. Okay. So at that point, companies are eager to create M's in order to substitute for human workers, and they're initially going to be looking for the people who are most productive at their jobs today, okay. the peak of their career, uh, the best. So you may well be the best at what you do, in which case you'd Thank have you. a shot, yeah. but they're looking for the best lawyer, the best software engineer, et cetera. Okay, great. And so, those so, people, they want to make billions of copies of them, or as many copies as there is demand for. Right, and see, that I feel like would add an interesting social dynamic, because right now you don't have... You know, I could be wrong about this, but I, I suspect the the uh, highest amount of twins at any given company is probably three people. But this would be a situation right. where you've got like 50, I don't know, uh, Warren Buffetts all operating at the same company that are all identical to one another. 
Right. So they're all going to fill the same job slot. So if your company has 50 lawyers, it might be 50 copies of the same lawyer. They have 500 software engineers, it'd be 500 copies of the same software engineer, maybe. Ugh. But now, in, initially, they're going to take the best people in our world, but quickly their world will change. And that means they'll no longer be so interested in the best people in our world. They'll be looking for people who are younger and flexible, who can learn to be the best in this new world. Okay. So, so in that situation, you would you would start uploading people um, that currently exist that are are you know fresh, they're right out of college or something like that, and then you figure out which ones have the most adaptability to where you could train them to be a software engineer, or you could train them to uh, you know be the head of a digital company or whatever. Because this whole new world is so different that people being good in our world of things won't necessarily be a good indication that they're good in this new world. And it'll probably be younger than college, maybe even five years old. They'll be looking for very young and flexible minds that can be trained in the whole new world, the whole new profession they'll have in the age of M. Hmm. I, yeah, I, I think I would vote against that. I would not be okay with uploading a five-year-old baby uh, in, into a computer in order to have well, it. Right. But you may not have a vote. Yeah, that's, that's true. I might not. Changes, unfortunately. Well, I, actually, one, one of the things I was curious, because you, you paint, uh, I think even early on in the book, you kind of paint this um, this interesting kind of sci-fi scenario, a uh, sci-fi scenario where um, you've got, you know, clans of people. So like, like in, in the context of your book, a clan is, you know, any amount of identical people that are from this original copy. Uh, and you've got um, them all living in a um, you know, within this digital world. In, in this future scenario, what happens to like regular meat people? Are, are you are you and I are presumably dead by this point? But like, are right. there like are there preserves for Amish people, sure. or like are we all like what, what what do you think would happen? So this age of M change becomes much faster. So today in our economy, we double roughly every fifteen years. Their economy may double every month. Mm -hmm. And that means within a year or two, they may see as much change as we see in centuries. Okay. And so the entire age of M I'm forecasting really only lasts a year or two in objective time. Oh. So at the very beginning, there's all these humans out there. And then a year or two happen. An enormous change happens within the M economy. But these humans just can't change much in a year or two. Right. So the population of humans at the end is pretty much the same as, as at the beginning. So humans are there. They're still existing, but they're on the margins. They're not running things. They're not in the middle of, of where the action is. Well, that actually makes me feel a lot better because I, I assume built into that assumption is that you, you could speed up processing time. So right now, if I want to increase my processing time as a meat person, all I can do is drink coffee. I don't really have a lot of options right. available to me in terms of trying right, to speed right. things up. But if, uh, if we were in a computer, we could run your computer at a higher processing rate so that exactly. what is 60 seconds per minute for me uh, is now you're experiencing months and months and months and what would be a minute uh, from, from my end, right? Exactly. So the typical emulation speed, I estimate, is about a thousand times human speed. Okay. Which means that in the one month time in which the economy doubled, they experienced a whole century. Uh, this sounds great. It's so me as a meat person, I just hop on Twitter and they're like, hey, we cured cancer. And I'm like, hey, well done. And then I go to lunch and then I come back and they're like, well, we figured out how yeah. to open up time portals. Neat. Like, just like by the end of the right, day, all sorts it, of cool stuff's happening. Sure. <laughs> but if something scary is happening, you, you're just out of touch. You, you <laughs> don't really have a plausible no, that, that, I can see that, too. Like, I, I open up my, my email newsletter, and it's like, uh, oh, bad news. Cyber Germany's declared war on cyber France. Then, you know, three minutes later, it's like, World War III is over. And I'm like, ah, it didn't even affect me. That was great. Easy going as wars go. Um, so you, you've got you've got this situation where you've got uh, people that are operating at, at such a, a high uh capacity of speed uh i assume that you're going to have people operating at different speeds depending on task or is it based more on yes. um status or what it's going to be based mainly on the task so like if you're driving a machine uh, it depends on how fast that machine needs a, needs a response so okay. for example if you're driving a truck you don't necessarily be much half faster than a human today if you're driving a yeah. human-sized truck right if you're driving a super tanker you can be even slower but if you're managing a nano factory you need to be as fast as it takes to keep up with whatever that mach machine does. Right. Okay. Or alternately, if you're if you're doing engineering or you're 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 doing um, you know uh, theoretical physics or something like that, then you might as well be going at top speed uh, because then you're you're able to apply that. Right. So so for software engineers who are in a race, basically as soon as the project gets funded, it's done. So they'll they'll wait for a long time to decide when the right time to fund a project is. But basically, a moment after the project's funded, they've spent the billion dollars. Hmm. And they either have what they hope for or they don't, because uh, they can really run that fast. So uh, your, your, your background is in economics, right, Doctor? I have a wide range of backgrounds. I okay. started out in physics, then I did uh, computer uh, AI research, oh. actually, for nine okay. years. And then I went back into social science and did some political science as well as economics. Okay. 
Nice. Uh, well, I, you're, you're, you're well beyond me in every single field. But one, one of the things I was curious about is if you have a situation in which we can now replicate an indefinite amount of Norm McDonald's, like it, you, could, you can make one or you can make like 400 of them. I as, because of the way supply and demand works, does this mean that all Norm McDonald's in this theoretical universe, every, every designated company comedian, um, are they going to wind up working for subsistence levels by virtue of the fact that there's not a, a natural um, stop on the amount of labor? Right. Yeah, so we go back to the situation that's the usual one in human history and the usual one in biology, which is near subsistence wages. The M's basically have to work most of the time so they can earn enough wages to just to exist. And that means uh, the most prestigious lawyers and the, you know, the most basic uh, janitors, they all make about the same amount of money. Huh. OK, so fairly, fairly egalitarian. But at the same like, are they are they wage slaves? Are they literal slaves? How do you see that uh, that panning out like in a in a in an actual rights capacity? Would people maintain rights, do you think? It, most likely they would have rights. Uh, but, you know, that might be cold comfort <laughs> when you know that you pretty much have to work or you can't exist. Right. Yeah, I would. I think um, in, in reading your book and in reading in uh, Permut- Permutation City, which, again, shares some some um, uh, philosophical overlap or at least some technological overlap. Uh, I would if I were in this if I were part of this world building scenario, I would want everybody that's getting plugged in to have like a uh, an internal digital switch that they could flip to like just quit existing because you could get into nightmare scenarios yeah. where, uh, hey, we want you to work at, uh, you know, Heaton's Widget Factory and you don't really like doing it, but we can torture you with pretty interesting simulations. Um, so I'd want them to have the ability to pop out. Yeah, I do mention that in the book, sort of a right to suicide. Right. It would be probably mechanically somewhat easy to arrange, but the hard part is to guarantee it. Mm, yeah. you know, obviously, if somebody wants to torture you, they'll want to turn off your suicide switch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we'll need somewhat intrusive monitoring to guarantee that that switch keeps working. Yeah. Um, so, OK, you, you said that you've got a background in AI. You've got uh, you, you've got a background in economics. You, you've got um, a, a fairly. A, a fairly diverse amount of, of fields that you're relying upon is is the book that you wrote is you it, couldn't write this book unless you had that range of right right backgrounds, i'll just say well i'm curious <laughs> so do, that's an unusual thing most people don't have that range of backgrounds so they couldn't really describe an entire civilization and that's what i try to do in this book i, we, I go through all the different aspects of it which you do you you go through very, very yeah it's, it's very intricate is is it more of a is it a prediction or a thought experiment? Because it is so detailed that the, the predictive capacity of it is is very, very vast. I mean, is it something that you, you would bank on if you had the ability, or is it more of this could be a scenario uh, as well, we move forward? Uh, there's two ways to say it. First, it's all conditional on a certain kind of technology being the first to be the human-level intelligence technology. So that's not obvious. Something else could be first, mm-hmm. in which case this whole scenario doesn't really play out. Okay. But I think there's a pretty substantial chance that this would be the first, at least 10%, okay. and maybe even over 50%. So uh, most of these forecasts are conditional on this scenario with te- this technology being the first kind of human-level AI. And then given that scenario, I would bet on each of the predictions, but not on the conjunction. Okay. Yeah, I, I've got hundreds of predictions in there. And so if I bet on all of them being true together, well, that's just crazy. Mm-hmm. Okay. But each one, I think, definitely has more likely than not it'll be play out that way. Fair enough. Uh, with with emulations, um, it's it's predicated on the idea. I think that um, it would the the best computer we have access to is the the you know moist computers in our skulls right now. The the, the best information processing unit is a brain, and so it would be better to uh, to transfer the the processing power of a human brain to a computer rather than try and, and create AI from scratch. If if we do that, why why maintain a person in a if 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 the goal from the sort of you know, quasi dystopian worldview is just to make money and you own a company. Why attempt to replicate people in their entirety? Why not just uh, isolate certain functions of them and have computer programs as opposed to autonomous people within this universe? Well, that comes down to basically the software in our brain and what it's like and its nature. So uh, most of the software we write is pretty modular. It's, it's little separate chunks that we can read and understand. And because of that, we can take parts of them and not take the whole thing often. But the brain is this just mess of spaghetti code. Uh, it seems pretty unlikely that we can usefully take chunks out of chunks of it away without, you know, really understanding it in great detail. So that means, at least for a while, it's a whole brain or nothing. So you're thinking that if if we were to download Warren Buffett and Norm Macdonald, and then we we tried to remove fear of death and um, you know love of status or something, that the, the they just wouldn't work as well anymore. 
unless it's something very localized, like your memory of last Christmas vacation or something. Gotcha. Okay. It's probably just not going to be hard, you know, not going to be doable to like take your uh, wit and somebody else's basketball ability and just munch them together into a new person. That's just not going to happen. How do you uh, how do you see relationships operating in such a world? Like, for example, let's say that you and I get along well in this interview. We are subsequently uploaded to a computer. Does that mean that all of the variants of us uh, in, in ad infinitum, you know, there's there's 4,000 uh, Dr. Hansons and, and right. 4,000 Heatons, we would just sort of on-site be like, oh, I remember that guy, he's great. Like, there'd, there'd be sort of an automatic type, like, uh, intrinsic relationship. Well, it depends on when we got to know each other. So okay. if we were friends at the very beginning of our lives, when there was each only one of us, then all of the thousands or millions of each of us will remember that. But if we become friends later on, then each of us won't remember right. all of the other versions. Okay. But we probably still, if one pair of us like each other, we recommend to the others, hey, why don't you check out this guy? And so there'll probably be this correlation. If we wouldn't just have a couple of pairs who like each other, there's probably either none or thousands. Okay. And so then you and I have a relationship, and then all the other pairs are kind of watching us. In a sense, we're all watching the other pairs. So if you, are, you and I have a fight, now that means to the other pairs, oh, they, may, they may have a fight. And so now we're all, you know, not no longer just a single relationship. We're a, this big parallel relationship. Did you, uh, did you watch Battlestar Galactica when that was on? I did. <laughs> oh, I love that series. It's a great series. They're, they're, they, they never really well, flushed out. End. I didn't like the end. But yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it definitely, it definitely kind of, yeah. But overall, though, I enjoyed it. And they, they never quite flush out the mechanics of it. But you, you get the strong impression that because the Cylons have, like, I think six different units, maybe seven units, um, that if one person, if one of these units makes a decision, they're like, I probably would have done the exact same thing. So it's sort of everyone's just like, okay, I guess that's what we're doing right now. There's not a necessarily a, an autonomous decision making uh, process for every single person. It's more of, okay, the, the blonde did this one thing. I'm, I'm also of the same unit. So right. I'll probably do the exact same thing. You've like hyper so that's Yelp. One of the hardest parts to imagine in this world, which is these clans of copies of the same per original person would probably have some sort of structure of governance. They, they would organize themselves and imagining that's hard because it, you know they have a lot less limitations than we do that is when we have a big government over a company or a club or a nation mm -hmm. you know we just have all this diversity inside and so we have all these conflicts but they have a lot fewer conflicts they share their values a lot more they share the same personality they have the same inclinations that makes it easier for them to have governance where they agree mm, okay. together on something but it's just how far it's hard to tell yeah, you'd have. I, I feel like you would have less friction, but also a lot more blind spots. So, for example, if if there are fifty thousand right. Andrew Heatons and we've formed the Andrew Heaton clan, uh, and we're all trying to like we're we're trying to get an agenda going, one of us would be like, "Hey, I know we really need to work out our security measures to make sure our software programming is not stolen, but you guys want to first write a Gilbert and Sullivan musical, and then like that's all we would do. Like it would be very right. difficult to actually organize us in a good way. But then again, I'm assuming that I'm probably not top billing for like IBM's theoretical physics department i'm 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 a at this situation i assume i'm a, a meat person right. out in the out in the the human uh preserves out in iowa or wherever yeah so group think is a real risk for a clan which probably means that for clan governance they probably hire outsiders to help give them advice okay so oh like that's what i'll do I'll, I'll, I'll become i'll become a digital consultant i think i could do that <laughs> well there's there'd be a demand for that but you'd have to be the best mm -hmm. um so can the world i only looks for the best can I, I want to run you through some philosophical questions because I think your your book goes into some interesting philosophy, and then I want to kind of bring it back to this the the period that we're in right now, looking forward with what's happening with with automation with robots. So on a on a philosophical level, um, there's a a great uh, a great question to kind of get your idea of um, how you perceive of self, soul, and metaphysics. And that is in this scenario, um, you can teleport between let's say a, a base on Mars and Earth. Uh, and when you walk into the teleportation booth, a clone of you is made with the exact same memories on Mars. And you right. have to wave at this person to confirm that the um, that the transfer, ha or not the transfer, that rather the, the cloning technology happened. And once they wave back at you, they just destroy your body, right? So in, in that scenario, I think I would be fine with that, actually. I think I would be okay with that because I, I, I have a fairly uh, materialist worldview, so I don't think that there's a magic right. intrinsic to me. I think I'm I'm basically a moist robot with memories, so I'm okay replicating that. Where are, are you in the same category, or, or would you be more protective of your moist I robot? Think body? I am, but I don't know until it happens. Yeah, <laughs> but the thing I'm more confident in saying is this emulation economy doesn't need everybody. So there's maybe 10 billion humans at that time, and the emulation economy is going to be focused on copies of the few thousand most productive humans for this new world. Okay. 
And so that selection of the few thousand most productive, part of that selection will be, are you okay with the usual things they do in the M world? So say you try the copy thing, and at that point, you just can't do it. You can't handle it. And you can't manage to make short-term copies that get deleted. That just, you know, you go crazy with that. And that turns out, well, that's just a headwind you face. That makes you less competitive. Now, maybe you're spectacular or something else to make up for it. But basically, most of the M's are going to be okay with this stuff because that's what it takes to live in their world. Okay, interesting. So so not everybody would necessarily have to breach that thing. And you, you're thinking that you would be okay with it in an abstract form? I, I think here's the weird thing for me is I in that scenario, I am fine with that depending on how you kill the body, right? So if it's my body is destroyed, the, the one that I'm currently in after I wave to the new body over on Mars that has my dick thing, if, if it's just like an immediate vaporization, I'm fine with it. But if you shot me, I'd be like, nah, I don't want to do it. Now it's really weird and visceral. I'm, I'm, I'm against this This happens now. actually a lot more than just the transport from Mars scenario. In the M world, typically what happens is most of the worker M's are temporary copies of it in a day that don't last till the next day. <laughs> so at the beginning of a work day, say, you make a bunch of copies of yourself, and all of those copies are working, and only one of the copies goes on to the next day. Wait so a minute. So All these other copies have to be okay with that. So I'm like, in this scenario, uh, that I, assuming I've made the cut, I wake up and there's like 50 of me, and I'm basically doing TaskRabbit. Like I've been, I've been, you know, uh, there's, there's some sort yeah. of digital version of Craigslist that I've, I'm here and they're like, Hey, Heaton, you're going to do this, this paperwork, but just for the day and at the end of the day, we're going to, we're going to delete you. I don't think I would do it. Right. I think I'd be like, Nope. Like well, you'd have to give me a pretty good incentive. Really quickly if you do that. But if you don't do that, you're at a big disadvantage because the other guy is willing to make 50 copies. He can get a lot more done. So then we, at that point, we've, we've got kind of like a shared identity thing where I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to exist for a day, but like, there's also an identical version of me that's going to keep working and, and that guy's going to get my salary. And really that guy's the same as right. me. So it doesn't matter as much. So I got this hypothetical uh, that I use in my talks. Mm -hmm. Imagine at the beginning of a party, you took a drug that meant you won't remember that party the next day or ever after. I'm told some people do that. Now, my yeah. question is toward the end of this party, are you saying to yourself, well, I'm about to die. That guy tomorrow, he isn't me because he won't remember what I did at this party. No, I'm so probably just getting analogy. phone numbers like nobody's business because I'm a lot less uh, less less afraid of saying something stupid, right? Right. Well, so that's the, that's the point. So you can get into a frame of mind where you don't think of this as dying, and that's the frame of mind they'll probably get into typically. They'll just find a way to think about it as, look, I go on tomorrow. I just don't remember this part of me. Yeah. Okay. I could see that. That could make sense to me. Um, all right. So next question for you. And actually, this is this is less theoretical. I read that you are planning to be cryogenically frozen when you die. Is that true? I am a customer of such a service. Wow. That, uh, they're supposed to do that. Cool. And that gives me a better shot to become an emulation. All right. In the sense that when initially when they're looking for people to experiment on their brains, you know, live humans will be kind of tough. Right. But okay. if they've got these old cryonic patients around, then they'll probably have more legal freedom to, uh, you know, scan those brains and play with them. Okay, how how optimistic are you that that uh, post uh, you know post death that you'll you'll be thought out and brought into something? Oh, I might give it five percent or more. But, okay, um, not not enormously optimistic, but it's better than letting worms eat you. That's <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And I, I like the adventure there uh, of, of being able uh, being, being able to look at the future. And go, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. Maybe we'll see. If not, well, Why not? no, give I'm fine either way. Um, all the rest of you can take this chance too if you want. It's not that hard. Yeah, we could all we could all get frozen and hang out later. Um, so in in the meantime, you know, we're here right now. There's really interesting stuff happening in AI. Um, it's it's we we are seeing more and more jobs automated. Um, we're about to probably see a bunch of jobs automated. In that right now, the the most common job in the United States is driver, and it seemed to be that we're getting pretty close to getting to driverless cars. And when that happens in mass, um, suddenly large portions of the population are unemployed. Um, within you know the the next few years moving forward, are you worried about our our capacity now as meat persons to deal with the influx of change coming about by automation and, and robots? Look, if if they manage to do self driving cars as much as they hope in the next decade or two, that'll be within the usual range of job disruption. Really, over the last century or two, we have seen a lot of job disruption. We've seen a pretty steady rate of it. And these sorts of things we're foreseeing in the near future aren't out of trend from those previous job disruptions. We, a lot of jobs get more automated, get more demand, less demand. There's just a lot of variation in demand for jobs in our economy. It has been for several centuries, and these things won't change that. So okay. we're not actually about to see a much larger rate of job displacement or automation than we've seen for the last few decades. Okay, interesting, and and that uh, th and that is that. I mean, that mathematically squares up. It's not just looking at like, look, there's always going to be some creative destruction going on, but actually, when you look at 
um, uh, dry, reactional uh, rates. J- jobs as much so like... Actually, okay. <laughs> actually, it turns out that over the last few decades, we've had a certain degree of stagnation. That is, growth today is a little lower really? than a decades ago. Okay. And it turns out that if we were about to see a big AI revolution, we should expect to see productivity higher. And having uh, automating all the driver jobs, and you'd have to do another 10 things like that to move us back up to the rate at which productivity was growing a few decades ago. So uh, these sort of scenarios are at best going to put us back up to where we were. Fascinating. So are you generally optimistic? You're, you're, you're not, because you read stories occasionally of people in Silicon Valley, like, you know, buying bunkers to protect themselves from the civil unrest when, when robots have replaced everybody. But it sounds to me like you're fairly optimistic. I'm optimistic over the next few decades, but eventually there'll be this big disruption. So the age of M happens kind of all of a sudden. That is, you don't have an emulation and then you do. So there's not much in between. And when emulations become feasible, then within, say, 10 years, basically all the humans lose their jobs. And that's a pretty big disruption. I'd really like us to be prepared for that. Right. I don't I th- think you need bunkers necessarily, but you need insurance. <laughs> you need money that will pay you when you don't have your job. Okay. Well, like on, on that, but I think, because I've encountered you once through this book, and I've also, I went to a, a Soho forum debate with you. Uh, Gene Epstein has been on the program a couple of times. Um, he, he moderates those. And you, you were, um, you, the premise at the time was uh, that um, robots or automation will dominate the future. And you, you seemed very bullish about that as well. In fact, I think it might have been you I was talking to that, that thought as long as you've got some kind of, um, some, some foot on the stock market in some capacity, that productivity right. will, be, will be so high, you're basically covered. As long as you've got, you've got some portion of the pie as it expands, you're going to be brought along right. with that economy. So the age of M, I'm estimating the economy doubles roughly every month. That means your wealth doubles every month. Your okay. investments double every month. So you don't need to have that much to start with for it to get big really fast. Of course, if you start with zero, zero doesn't double too much at all. I... You need to start with something. But uh, if you have a sub- any substantial wealth, then it gets really large really fast. So the main thing is to make sure everybody has at least something like that. Okay. We, uh, are you in favor of UBI? UBI isn't very well targeted. So I think you need insurance against the robot revolution. Okay. <laughs> you need a contract that you pay a premium, and then when the robots take all, displace all the jobs, then you start getting payments. That's much cheaper than UBI. UBI uh, is yeah. not conditional, you see. It's, it's just everybody gets money all the time for anything. Right. And that's vastly more expensive and hard to manage, and it's not really well targeted to this risk. The risk is at some point all the humans lose their jobs, and so we want an insurance targeted to that specific risk. So, so it would be like redundancy insurance or downsizing insurance, except that in, in this instance it would be automation. So you pay five bucks a month or whatever, right. but in but, the event that your job is replaced by a robot, you're good? Huh? So often people talk about UBI as if it was based on some local government, like a state or, or a nation, and that doesn't work because the robot economy may not at all be equally distributed around the world. It might only happen in a few places. So if you have a UBI where you redistribute the income of Argentina and there really aren't any robots in Argentina, you're redistributing nothing. You got nothing. Oh, okay. You right. really want to buy insurance with an insurance company that has global reinsurance. So even today in the insurance industry, they reinsure globally. They don't just base it on local assets. They base it on global assets. Interesting. Okay. Are you, are you in, when, when, say, like Elon Musk comes out and says that we are probably all going to be killed by robots, like he's very worried about AI, um, he's, he's concerned that uh, it will be malignant or, or may not malignant, but it'll, you know, view us as bugs, that kind of thing. Now, granted, AI is a step beyond what you and I have been discussing in, in the immediate future and in the age of M, since I think um, you're, you're uh, conditioning all of this on, on M's probably being a, a technology developed prior to AI. That said, though, are you worried about AI? Do you, do you share any of those kind of apocalyptic Terminator concerns that we see coming out of, say, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, or, or are you optimistic about that as well? So for AI, uh, it'll be very powerful eventually, and then it'll grow very fast eventually. And like any technology, it could be out of your control, any one particular version of it. That's true for an airplane or a car or, you know, a bomb. Mm-hmm. So for all technology, we should be paying attention to things that could go wrong with it and making sure we have adequate controls and safety. I don't think we need any more extra concern about this than the others in the sense of being worrying about way in advance. So we really don't know much about the details of AI yet. It's just just a long way off. So I don't think we can do that much useful right now to prepare for the things that could go wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you think it's going to be an issue, like save resources and and be ready to do something later, but you kind of have to see the details. It's like worrying about cars in 1700, (laughs) you know, worrying about nuclear bombs in 1500. Right. 
you know, even if you can sort of vaguely imagine the, the kind of thing it might be and, and the rough outlines of the problems, you just you just don't know enough hmm. to to be very useful. What, what do you see as the timescales for the, the various things we've talked about? So, for example, um, w- if and when uh, do you think cryogenic um, thawing would be a, a viable technology? Um, when do you think emulations are likely to hit society? And when do you think AI would likely hit? So the, the key point is that the economy has been doubling roughly every 15 years for a century or two. Mm-hmm. And that'll probably continue at that same rate until it doesn't. Okay. Is, there'll be a time when all of a sudden things start to speed up, either with M's or AI or something. And at that point, you don't really want to be making forecasts in terms of years. I think it makes more sense to make it in terms of doubling times. Okay. So today, the doubling time is 15 years. With AI, it might be a month. And I more want to say, how many doubling times will it be till something happens? And so I'd, I'd say within our current regime, it'll be a half a century to several centuries, roughly, until we get uh, some form of AI, either M's or the other sort. But then when that happens, within a few years, you have vast amounts of change, which would also include cryonics. Right. So uh, it's, it's about when that clock starts. But as soon as that new, faster clock starts, just so much happens in such a short time, it doesn't make much sense to talk about years then. Well, that's fascinating. That's also, you've sort of, you've created a new uh, chronological unit, of, which is the doubling of an economy, as opposed to, you know, what nor- normally we do is measure things by years or months or whatever. That's an interesting way of looking at it. And I suppose you'd have to, because... It, in the, it compresses the past as well, because in the farming world, uh, it doubled roughly every thousand years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and well, so you, you, th- you, a, you think know, about, like, ma- mankind, we've been around, what, 250,000 years or so? Uh, GDP growth, pretty low the first 200,000 years right. or so. So before about 10,000 years ago, the number of humans doubled roughly every quarter million years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it was even slower. So if in terms of doubling times, then, you know, we're, you're collapsing the past and pulling it into, a, you know, not that many doubling times ago. Yeah. Uh, and then and then presumably once we're at that end part, uh, as, as previously noted, because you've got a, you've got varying processing speeds, um, everything changes because you've now got a, a brain click that's going at an incredibly high rate. Actually, that, that reminds me, in the book, you, you kind of, you can get into status levels and the idea that um, your income would be, would, would naturally reflect the processing power you could buy. Therefore, the people that are doing very well would be going at a very high speed because they're kind of leading the pack. Uh, whereas um, the, the laggards like myself that managed to slip in the back were going at a very low speed. So I might, I might be operating, but I might be seeing everything at an even slower ability than, than regular meat people are. And uh, th- thus, there's a kind of like chronological time inequality going on. Right. So my, my best guess is that faster M's are seen as higher status because they embody more wealth. They learn things fast. They host meetings. They you know win arguments, et cetera. Mm-hmm. It's a rough guess. Uh, and then typically retirees are slow. So uh, M's are in principle immortal, but that doesn't mean they have an infinite, infinite career. So I, I guess that they really kind of have to retire after a century or two because uh, their minds just get more fragile after that point, and they're no longer flexible and can compete with mon- young minds. They, they don't have to die. They can last for a long time, but they probably haven't saved it up enough money to keep going fast, and so they have to switch to a slow retirement. And so at that point, M retirees are slow like humans are. And now both M retirees and humans are both, their main long-term risk is the stability of this entire civilization. Mm-hmm. That is, if the civilization lasted forever, then they could last forever. But because they're going so slow, if there's any major war or revolution or disaster, they're going to experience it soon, and that may be the end. Is there any, um, is there, is there any physical cap on how many people could exist in this world? Where, where, if we're talking about IMS specifically, you still have to have computers that are, um, that are dealing with the amount of people living in them. You still have to have cooling mechanisms to make sure that there's not too much right. heat. So is there a, a point at which there's a maximum saturation where we could have like, you know, 20 trillion well, people or something, but after that, just not likely? So Earth is finite. The solar system is finite. So that means there's a finite limitation. But I'm focused on the next era after ours, not the infinite future. So right. that's, that's the key point to make about my forecast. Okay. We've In the past, we had the foraging era. We had the farming era. We're now in the industrial era. I'm trying to describe this next era. But I'm guessing it only lasts a year or two because within that time, we'll have as much change as we had in each of the past eras. And there'll be something after that. And in this book, I'm just not telling you what. So for the duration of this age of M, where things double every month in the last year or two, for that duration, there's plenty of room. You don't run out of space. Okay. Uh, Well, uh, Dr. Hansen, I... Later on, you might. (laughs) 
I, I enjoyed talking to you. I, I enjoyed the book. It, like I said, I the 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 science. I do not have nearly as many fields of expertise under my belt as you do, but I do really enjoy science fiction. And for that reason, I kind of felt like I was reading a a, a think tank paper by a sci fi author or vice versa. And so it was really fun to read. I, I enjoyed talking to you and enjoyed having you on. Thank you. Well, then I succeeded, and I'm proud. <laughs> Hey, before we leave, Mark Levin is another commentator here on The Blaze, and he has a new book coming out called On Freedom of the Press, which is his take on the degeneration of America's free press into a, quote, standardless profession that has squandered the faith and trust of the American public in... Okay. Mark Levin is another commentator here on The Blaze, and he has a new book coming out called Unfreedom of the Press, which is his take on the degeneration of America's free press into a, quote, standardless profession that has squandered the faith and trust of the American public, end quote. Levin takes direct aim at the partisan party press through its own abandonment of repertorial integrity and objective journalism. That book, Unfreedom of the Press, drops later this month, but you can pre-order it on Amazon now. If you are a Mark Levin fan or you have serious qualms about the current state of the mainstream media, then Unfreedom of the Press is right up your alley. I would also like to encourage you to check out the Chad Prather Show, uh, Humor Me with Chad Prather, right here on The Blaze. I am a regular guest on that program, and I'm told that I really enjoy it. Although I frankly have no idea because my segment is Highballs with Heaton, so I'm pretty squiggly by the end. If you've ever thought... Heaton sure is uptight. I like his show, but I wish he would lighten up and say what he's actually thinking. To a cowboy. That's pretty much exactly what Chad and I are doing. We don't always see eye to eye, but we like each other. And we wind up taking an Uber home from the studio because we're responsible citizens. All right, a little bit of listener feedback before we wrap up the program. On iTunes, Starfurietza, Starfurizetta says, Thanks the Justin Robert Young. I found a podcast... That's more politically nutritious than a beef smoothie. Why, thank you. And excellent callback. You can watch this whole show on YouTube. If you look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton, you can see my handsome bearded face and assortments of suits and the dead buffalo head we screwed to the wall. Watching Something's Off with Andrew Heaton on your computer or phone really makes the most sense. I mean, you can try to watch it on your belt buckle, but I don't think that's going to get very far. And if you try to watch it on somebody else's belt buckle, well, pff, you're going to get into a fist fight. So go to YouTube and start watching full episodes. I look like I'm the real Heaton and not a robot. But looks like test results for OxyContin can be deceiving. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heaton or Facebook me at Facebook.com slash Mighty Heaton or even email me by subscribing to my newsletter at MightyHeaton.com and just replying when I send it out on Fridays. Finally, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps other people discover this here political orphanage. Thank you and good day.